You're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, Richard. Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Well, this is a bumper edition because we're also joined by our old friend Francois Tomazo. Bonsoir. And another special guest today, Jonathan Votters. Hey, guys. Jonathan Votters, of course, uh, the manager, chief executive of Slipstream Sports, who run the Cannondale Drapac professional team. <laughs> yeah? Well, you're, you're nodding That's what at we that. do. That's you're nodding at that. I think I got that right. Uh, we're going to talk about Jonathan Suit. We're also going to talk about why you guys are here in a moment. But first of all, let's have Lionel's weekly news roundup. The big news of the week uh, came like a bolt from the blue. It was the announcement by ASO that the owner of the Tour de France, along with RCS and Flanders Classics, would be reducing team sizes for the Grand Tours from nine to eight riders and for the Classics from eight to seven riders starting next season. The UCI quickly issued a statement saying that any change would have to wait pending agreement by the Professional Cycling Council. Uh, on the track at the Manchester Velodrome, Ed Clancy and John Mould of JLT Condor won the opening round of the Champions League. Daniel, are you going to do the anthem? No, he's not going to do the anthem. Uh, the top World Tour team was Elia Viviani and Peter Kennock of Team Sky in fourth place. Cannondale Drapak were fifth. feel I should mention that, seeing as Jonathan's here. Um, meanwhile, one of Ed Clancy's bikes was stolen in a raid by thieves on the Condor warehouse in central London. So if you see a distinctive black and yellow Condor uh, worth about... Five grand, I think, they are. Uh, but if you see one on eBay for sort of 500 quid, then do call the police. Um, some news from Belgium. <laughs> Public service there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Crime Watch. We're doing a bit of Crime Watch there. There's a man who sounds like he has intimate details of the case. <laughs> yeah, the, the bikes are very nice. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't, don't search my shed this weekend, please, please. Uh, Gent Wevelgem will be taking the Peloton off-road next March. They're going to have three sections of farm track basically unpaved, grassy, muddy tracks, totaling 5.2 kilometres between the two climbs of the Kemmelberg near the village of Plugstiet. Not familiar with these bits of road, but uh, there's some footage on sports' website. looks quite dramatic, taking the peloton into the countryside. It, the organisers say it's to commemorate the victims of World War I as the riders will pass a monument to the famous Christmas Day truce in 1914 at the start of the second section. Sticking with the Belgian classics, we already knew this, but it's been confirmed that the Moor at Gerardsbergen is back on the menu at the Tour of Flanders, um, as is Ten Bos in Brakel, which is kind of Peter van Pettigem's signature climb. But out goes the Molenberg, which is a shame, because that's one of the prettiest little climbs. Um, the race will also go through the hometown of Olympic champion Greg van Avermaet. Uh, Vincenzo Nibali has confirmed that he will ride the 100th edition of the Giro. Not his 100th edition of the Giro, that would be impossible. Uh, presumably he'll be <laughs> aiming for a third overall victory and he'll assess his Tour de France ambitions after that. And finally, former World Individual Pursuit Champion and the current Aussie Road Champ, Jack Bobridge, has announced his retirement at the age of just 27. He said in an exclusive interview with the Adelaide Advertiser that it's because of the effects of rheumatoid arthritis. Does he still hold the 4,000 metre world record, Bob Ridge? Yeah, I think he does, doesn't he? Does he does yeah, still he hold the 4K and... world record. Yeah. Was he riding for you at the time, Jonathan? Yeah, he was. Yeah, because yeah, he right. well, he's been yeah. around a few yeah, teams. That's, that's um, still a very young man and, and somebody yeah. who a few years ago we were talking about as the next great Australian talent. Um, yeah. He was you, world U23 time trial champion yeah, in obviously 2009. Had, had troubles with arthritis. Is that, it must be sad for, for you to somebody who knows him to see him yeah those retire. problems started kicking up pretty early in his career and i remember our team doctors um talking to him about it and they said listen you know this is a pretty serious autoimmune issue that he's got going on here that's going to be you know only inflamed by continuing to race bikes so you know incredibly talented rider uh but probably made the right decision there well, listen you're, you guys francois and jonathan you're in london uh it was our cycling podcast Christmas dinner last night and you were the special mystery guest Jonathan I mean you were a special mystery guest as well Francois but yeah as usual <laughs> <laughs> but Jonathan you were the one dressed in the Santa Claus outfit did you have a pleasant evening oh absolutely I I've always wanted to dress up as Santa Claus um unfortunately I don't think I tricked too many people for too long um well they had to guess who it was and there were a few questions that hinted that the right. questioner knew who you were yeah yeah that yeah it, Matt Matt Slater, Slater, he got it. He got it right pretty early on. Um, 
It was the beard Orla underneath Shinui the beard. asked if you were the manager of Wigan Athletic. I think that was her question. Yeah, that was that was, it. <laughs> that was a good one too. Yeah, that was. Anyway, I had a I had a wonderful evening. It was it was it was a hoot. I uh, got to meet a lot of new people and got to to uh, reconnect with a, a lot of old friends. What does the off season sort of? I mean, it's not very long. The off season. I know you've got a Valon meeting later this week, but what what does the off season look like for you typically? From a management perspective, we're uh, usually busier in the off season than we are during the season. Um, not saying the directors necessarily, but you know um, the license application process. You know, from an external standpoint, it sounds like all the team just sort of like breeze through it and fax in one or two documents. Do we do faxes anymore? Um, UCI does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, and we're off and running. It's actually a really uh, complex and intensive process to uh, to get that registration off the ground. And the amount of scrutiny each and every team is put under is very high and gets higher and higher each and every single year. Um, so we've been very busy with that, um, very busy attempting to plan our calendar and the rosters that we will place in those uh, races, um, although that just had a giant wrench thrown into it um, by the roster size reduction. So, um, and then, you know, of course, training camps uh, and getting, getting those up and off and running. So it's, it's actually, it's not an off season at all for management. My off season, quite frankly, is in the middle of July a lot of times. So, Jonathan, you men mentioned the roster reduction, the Giro, the Tour, the Vuelta, presumably, and all of the Flanders Classics, one rider less per team from next year. So, say, the organisers, the UCI, um, say that that's a bit premature. Uh, what's your feeling on it, and do you think it will go through next year? Fundamentally, conceptually, I don't have a problem with it. Um, there are other team managers that do, but for me, I don't have a problem with it. I have a big problem with it being announced out of nowhere by one party in the sport uh, on November 25th or 26th or whenever it was, uh, when we've already got most of this stuff off and running, and we've told riders, you know, your objective for the year is the Giro, your objective for the year is this, that, and then all of a sudden, oh, well, I'm not sure you're going to be doing that race now. Um, that's, you know, that's just not, you know, it's, it's not it's not responsible behavior to, to, to do it that way. Um so, very much enjoyed your tweet, Jonathan, which um, ended with a "not considerate" and exclamation mark in the style of Donald Trump. It was, it was all, all it was all it was all it was all it was missing was the hashtag crooked Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to use that hashtag going forward. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, yeah uh, no, it was just uh, whatever. Not cool. It was just not cool at all to do it that way. Um, have you had worried riders on the phone saying, yeah. you know, how does this affect me? Yeah, 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 of course, because, you know, there are guys that, you know, of course, your principal riders, I mean, Seth Van Mark is going to be doing Flanders, end of story. But, you know, that sort of seventh, eighth position, uh, maybe it's a neopro, maybe, you know, a guy like Ryan Mullen, right? But now all of a sudden he's sort of, you know, right on the limit as to whether he gets to do that race again. And, you know, it's very disruptive, Um if they want to make that decision at the PCC meeting in March, right before Paris Nice, and implement it in 2018, I don't have a problem with that. It doesn't that doesn't bother me at all. I don't understand why the riders' union hasn't kicked up. I mean, I, I figure, why is it the team manager? I've seen an interview with Jim Ockwitz and Patrick Lefevre and myself or whatever kicking up on this issue. I mean, I hope that the riders understand um, that. This means in 2018 there'll be somewhere between 40 and 80 riders without a job uh, in the World Tour anyway because of that measure. Now, I can sit here and say for my own selfish reasons, well, you know, having three or four guys less in my roster saves a little bit on budget. Great, no problem. Um, but if I'm Johnny Buño, the president of the Riders Union, I would I would think he should be the first person speaking up and saying we don't want this to happen. But I haven't seen that. I'm happy to hear Jonathan says, uh, say, you know, include the riders as a party in the sport. Because uh, I've been covering this sport for 30 years. And there's a voice I've never, ever heard. And that's the rider's voice. So once again, I'm not surprised that they, they don't speak up. They never do. They never stand up for their rights. Only when there's a, you know, tragic crash or something do you hear the riders. Otherwise, 
you know, all, all the talk we'll, we'll be having or we, we, we keep having about the future of the sport, there's always been one voice missing and there's always been the riders. Um, and it's funny because I was talking to Romain Bardet during the Tour de France, you know, because he's a like, kind of modern, new generation, new school, whatever, you know, clever guy, and telling him, right, you know, listen, Romain, you've got a contract for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 40 years probably with AG2R. You, uh, you, you don't have a problem with that. You, uh, you're clever, you're young, you're modern, you, you, you're, you're educated. Why don't you speak up for, for the writers? Why don't you take, uh, you know, take up the job as the spokesman of the peloton? And he said, well, you know, we've got short-term contracts. I'm, I'm concentrating on writing. Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, to make uh, enemies in the bunch more. Maybe my manager won't like it. And I've heard that forever. The, speak, the writers never speak up. But we know also that writers, uh, it's the same has gone with the doping question, where writers on the way up have been very outspoken. And as soon as they get to a certain point, they're not. And a lot of people interpret that as, oh, you know, they've crossed over to the dark side or they're part of the amerta. But a lot of the time, it's, it's a simple, practical, pragmatic um, exercise because to, to put your head above the parapet, we all know what would happen at the Tour de France. If Roman Bardet sort of appointed himself as the writer's spokesman, there'd be crowds of people around his bus every day looking for comment, as there used to be around 2008, 2009 with David Miller, you know, for three years... He was the guy, the go-to guy for any sort of doping quote. And he accepted that responsibility. But it certainly yeah. took a no. lot of, it was, involved a lot of stress, took a lot away from... I'm not saying Roman Bardet should be the only guy. Uh, there should be more guys. There are sports when, when, when uh, you know, athletes took over. I mean, tennis was one, you know. In football, they managed to impose, I mean, football, you know. How can you be more selfish than a football player, you know? And they still managed to have a union and, and obtain something which riders never did. So to get back to the to the first part of the, 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 the story, that's, you know, the u unilateral decision by uh, race organizers to, to change the numbers. I mean, the, knowing Christian, knowing ASO, and knowing these guys, that the, 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 it's their way to say, well, this is what we need need to press for and that's what we need to do quickly and but obviously they, they can't decide by themselves of course the UCI must be involved of course the, the teams must be involved and of course I don't see it happen before 2018 you know but it's their way to say to press that that's that's always the way to do it you know okay this is what, what that, that's the decision we're making and then there'll be uh, as Jonathan was saying and then around March there'll be a meeting and they say okay that is a good idea but we'll do it next season that's the way I see it <laughs> Uh, it's um, Why is it that we communicate via press? It's like <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's 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 it, like I could just send Christian Prudhomme an email, or he could send me one, or what? I was, instead, it's like no, no, I'll do an interview with Lekeep, and he'll read it, and then he'll know what I'm thinking. <laughs> or send out the press release at quarter to five on a on a Friday afternoon, which is what they did. Francois, it's interesting. You, you know, you talk about the lack of voice, uh, the riders' lack of voice. Um, I think part of it is to do with the dynamics, the very unique dynamics of cycling in the peloton. But I think part of it is just to do with the way a certain culture, certain cultures of behaviour and patterns of behaviour happen to develop in certain sports and certain environments. I mean, I, I find it interesting to see the different reactions to Trump, for example, in the different American sports. Like the NBA was incredibly vocal about Trump. And the NFL was almost silent. And, you know, from a socio-democratic point of view, from, a, you know, even in terms of ethnicities represented, not that different, um, the NFL and the NBA. But, you know, cycling just seems to have developed this kind of culture um, for various reasons of, of not really speaking up. I mean, I think that, well, I talked about this on our earlier podcast, but I, I think it's just fear. Yeah. Um, cycling is a world where if you're known as um, a loudmouth, to use a derogatory term um, for someone that's outspoken, that your opportunities are very limited, that you limit your opportunities. If you're the one that sticks your head up, you burn a lot of bridges. Um, David Miller is a great example of that. David Miller has a lot of people who love him in the sport, and he also has a lot of people who hate him in the sport. He, by sticking his head above and just speaking his mind, he has limited his opportunities in cycling. So have I. By keeping your head down and just being a good worker, then you can kind of go everywhere. And by the way, when teams are folding and new ones are coming in and circulating like that, do you want to be the guy that's limited your opportunities? Do you want to be the guy that's pissed off someone else because you spoke up about an issue? I think that's no, a huge because you, it's like you're a frog jumping from lily pad to lily pad. Yeah. You've got to keep all the lily pads open. Yeah, I mean, when, when the typical contract length, even for the biggest stars, is three years maximum, two years 
Um, I think it's that's a huge factor. And, you know, I mentioned the NBA there. I mean, perhaps one reason why um, NBA players felt liberated during the Trump campaign was that NBA contracts tend to be five, six, seven years. Very long and guaranteed. Yeah. And also, yeah, guaranteed, but also for multiple millions of dollars. I mean, you know, eight, ten, fifteen million dollars. Um, cyclists, then there's no one earning anything close to anything close to that but just a point of order there Jonathan mentioned an earlier podcast um, little plug for our next Friends of the Podcast special uh, 2020 Vision should be out any day now uh, sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com if you want to listen to that it's a look at the future of cycling and uh, basically in an hour and a half we solve all the problems of cycling and suggest a clear way forward I don't want to get in trouble for overselling uh, what we talk about in that episode, but that's what we do. It's it's all all better after you've listened to that. I think I, I just I just wanted to be a little bit prov- provocative because JV is here. But um, what what are the riders afraid of? Managers most of the time. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, they're afraid of not getting a job, and you can not get a job for a number of different reasons. I mean, um, think about. Uh, a little bit earlier, you know, in 2009, 2008, sort of that era in cycling, there were a lot of riders that if a team manager took on that rider, they would be jeopardizing their invitation to the Tour de France. I mean, um, if we really want to boil it down, when Floyd Landis was looking for a place to come back in cycling and Johan Bernil and, and Lance Armstrong decided not to take him back into the team because they thought it was a politically bad decision and that ASO wouldn't let them into the Tour de France, I mean, imagine had that been different and that Floyd was riding for Radio Shack in 2009. I mean, the landscape of cycling would be totally different at this point in time. So, But to say that, that that sort of fear of riders, of managers, of managers, of race organizers, that there's we are not in the same business together, which is the fundamental problem. It's just until everybody is doing the same business – it's all stuff like this is always going to happen. Instead of doing the same business, what we're doing is fighting each other for the little crumbs that exist, and that's what causes the fear. Oh, fair enough. I agree a hundred percent with what uh, Jonathan just said. It's uh, <laughs> no, that's right. If 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 we could find, I know that it's it's all well. You know, your your special feature on the future of cycling, I, I'm sure, solves the problem. But but it's it's. Uh, <laughs> It's it's absolutely you know it's it's obvious that, that that's the main problem of cycling when, when and that's the reason why you've got the organisers you you know one sidedly announcing a, a decision without consulting the others everybody seems to to be living in in a different world when in, in the at the end of the day that's that's why I'm I'm, I'm really insisting on that on that uh, on the voice of the riders. Maybe one way for cycling to change would be one day for the riders. I'm not saying one rider or two riders or three riders, but the, the riders to say, now, listen, we want this to change. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go on strike. We're not doing the tour. We, 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 you, we're not doing this stage. I mean, you know, press for your, your, your interest. Force, maybe force organizers, managers, everybody at UCI to sit at the same table and you know, devise, devise the rules that are best for the riders. And if they're best for the riders, normally they'd be best for the spectators, they'll be best, best for the business. Once again, that's what that's what uh, football, you know, did for the, the Bosman case. They wanted to be able to go to any team the, w- w- within the European Union and then it got, uh, you know, even beyond the European Union. They, they won in court, you know. And once again, the uh, tennis, well, m- maybe it was not the ideal solution when you see what the WTA and the ATP b- became. But at least these guys at one stage and a very crucial stage of the evolution of their sport, they said, now that's enough. We're taking over. Yeah? I, I've really been waiting for, you know, uh, some of these guys to stand up and say, now, you know, maybe aging riders are about to retire or guys like Peter Sagan, I don't know. There might be a way for riders to... Exp- as long as riders don't stand up for their rights. You know, I, I, do you know what it is? <laughs> it's bullshit. It's bullshit, isn't it? Um, just on a technical point of view, a tactical technical point of view, Jonathan, um, this, this measure is being introduced nominally to kind of to sky-proof, to to froom proof that to, i mean it reminds me of when they talked about tiger proofing golf courses as long as there was a tee and a green and a flag it was impossible to tiger proof a golf course um and it's kind of the same you know with the, the tour de france you know reducing teams by one um right i'm not sure that's going to have the desired effect of you know uh, neutering the sky train which supposedly made the tour de france you know less interesting this year but um one thing that strikes me straight away is that it will be difficult f- 
it will be much harder for teams to go in with multiple goals. And, you know, we've seen teams in the past try to go in with a sprint train and general classification goals, and that will be tougher with eight riders, won't it? Yeah, I mean, doing doing the double, um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot harder with eight starting off because you've always got to assume you're going to lose at least one, you know, illness, crash, whatever, right? So really you're you're looking at seven guys, you know. It's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, that that's it, it will make that very difficult. I think, you know, to if, if the interest is to sky-proof races, um, I, for me, that's coming at it from the wrong angle. I mean, if, if, if the, the real reason was road safety and so on and so forth, there is an argument there. Bigger pelotons are more dangerous, especially on small roads. Um, but if it's to sky-proof the peloton, if that's the objective, first of all, it would be nice if everyone would just be honest about that objective. But, um, you, you know, you look at budget caps. Start looking at budget caps and stop, stop looking at, at numbers of, of riders in the race. And, and because at the end of the day, you know, you could, you could have it down to six guys. And, and, and if you had a team of, you know, Chris Froome and Peter Sagan and... Um, Come on, I, you can name a third yeah. bike rider. Yeah. Sure. No, no, I'm just I'm trying to name a third like very high paid bike rider. I don't know, right. Kiatowski, whatever. That you could still come up with, you know, six guys that are 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 going to be dominant. Now, maybe not exactly as dominant as nine, and so on and so forth. But like, if if your budget says I can pay six guys four million euros each, believe me, you can come up with a team that can still dominate a race with only six guys. Um, so if that's the real reason, and I don't, you know, I don't know what the real reason is, but if that is, if skyproofing is the real reason, then you need to look at financial fairness as opposed to team sizes. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring Cycling Podcast. Um, they are showing the second round of the Revolution Champions League. Still no, Daniel. Theme, still no theme no. from Daniel. Uh, this weekend, sun, Saturday, uh, is being broadcast on Eurosport at 7 o'clock. Um, round one was last weekend. You mentioned that earlier, Lionel, Canada draft night were fifth. Jonathan, uh, well, you, you're in London at the moment. Are you going to be able to pop in to Revolution this yeah, weekend? Friday, Friday night. Friday night, I'm intending on checking it out, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, the feedback we've gotten uh, from the first race uh, that Bevan and Mullen were in uh, has been really good. Uh, they enjoyed it. Um, they did well. I don't think you knew they were such accomplished track riders. I, I, yeah, I had no idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know that they knew that they were such accomplished track riders either. Um, but uh, it, it was overall a really positive uh, experience. And, you know, that's a, that's a deal that, that Velon put together on, on behalf of uh, the Velon members. And um, so far, so good. You know, great crowds. Uh, the riders enjoyed it. Didn't seem to be any overly dangerous anything going on so well, I'm, I'm supportive I, I got a text to. message from James Pope who organizes the, Re- the revolution the man behind the revolution series and he obviously listened to last week's podcast and the our little discussion about the use of the Champions League name he did say that he would clarify that for me I haven't actually managed yet to catch up with him but I will do for next week definitely we can assume that he is allowed to use that arrangement yeah well, I think he's certainly allowed to use it yeah. I think he's yeah I should have called him to check and I meant to do that but um Time ran away with me. Watch, Sorry. Watch your space. Maybe Sorry, in a, Maybe in a couple of weeks I'll we ret- can clarify that. I'll, before, <laughs> before, before next year's uh, Revolution Series Champions League, I'll clarify exactly what the story is there. Um, Jonathan, talking uh, or thinking more about the, the team, you've made a couple of new signings for next year. I mean, you made a couple of new signings this time last year. You know, Rigoberto, Ran Pierre Roland. Um, I think it's fair to say, a disappointing season is that how you look at it? I mean, you finish sort of midway up the yeah, World I mean, Tour series, but no, no win in a no World big, Tour yeah. event. It was a, b- a bizarre season uh, for us. I wouldn't necessarily say disappointing because you have to remember we're the youngest team in the World Tour in the median age by I think one or two years. So it's a pretty big difference. So, so from that respect, you know, it's a team that's learning. Um, it's also a team that, as opposed to you know chasing a big name sprinter just to knock up wins. Um, we, you know, went after riders of the future, I'd say, like Davide Formolo, like Joe Dombrowski. Um, and you have to be patient. You know, one, winning a mountain stage is, you know, a, a, a bigger mountain to climb, literally, um, you know, than, than, than winning a flat stage out of a breakaway or, or a sprint, so on and so forth. Um, so, 
we, but we chose to take that on. And that, you know, is just going to take patience. Interestingly, and this wasn't by design or anything else, eighth place in the final UCI rankings, it's the highest a Slipstream team has ever finished in the UCI rankings. So it's sort of, I don't, I mean, I can't be disappointed in that. I mean, you can argue and say that the rankings are wrong or whatever. Okay, fine. But we've never finished that high before. So that was kind of a, almost like a little bit of a head scratcher in some ways. Um, but we did it. And we did it um, with, you know, a guy like Alberto Betiol, who I think ended up 18th or 19th ranked rider in the world that nobody even knows who he is. And he did a great job all season long. And it wasn't that he was trying to score points by getting seventh place or whatever. If you watch him in Grand Prix Plouet, I mean, he was trying to win the race. He just ended up getting second. And uh, Joe Dombrowski in, in mountain stages in the Giro d'Italia, he was trying to win him. He just ended up, you know, third and second and so on and so forth. So, I mean, we, you know, we played the game to win all year long. Um, well, I mean, certainly the Giro with Iran at the Tour with Roland, a lot of bad luck, I think, with health and crashes. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. I mean, those were those were rough. Um, you know, Rigo, yeah, he just got sick. And I think, in, in a way, we're going to reposition Rigo a little bit for next year and that, um, you know, get him focused, I think, on, on races that are more explosive and shorter and maybe not so much on Grand Tours. Um, and then with Pierre... I mean, even though his Tour de France didn't end up what I would have liked, um, I have an immense amount of respect for that guy now because I have never seen a guy hit the deck that hard and get back on his bike. And we assumed he was just going to drop out of the race at that point. And he said, no, I promised you guys that I was going to do a good Tour de France, and so I'm going to do a good Tour de France. And he finished the stage, not that poorly and the next morning and this is when usually the bullet hits the bone with crashes like that right the next morning the guy gets dropped kilometer five or whatever and he's out of the race right the next morning very hard mountain stage again and Pierre's immediately in the breakaway on the first climb I mean unbelievable that the, the the toughness that that kid has and the passion that he has for the Tour de France he may not be the most passionate rider when he's outside of the Tour de France but when he's in that race I I actually developed a huge respect for him and you know, unfortunately, that only showed up as a 16th place on GC, and there was no stage win, and so on and so forth. But eventually, that'll pay off. I, I, I have faith that that he'll he will come good at some point in time. You just you just can't be that tough and that passionate about the sport and that talented and not have it roll your way eventually. He was our overall pedaler de charme for the Tour de France, wasn't he, Pierre Hollande? Um, I presented him with his T-shirt on the Champs Elysees. He was, he was very bashed up, and uh, uh, but presumably once his wounds had all healed, he would have would have worn that T-shirt Before with pride. Didn't wear, <coughs> didn't wear it while he was still <laughs> Francois, what's the impression of Pierre Hollande in in France? Does, is he still seen as a bona fide Frenchman, even though he rides for an American team? We've had, we've had lots of uh, of riders, uh, you know, riding for foreign teams. Anyway, uh, I think that's the probably the, the best move he ever made in his career to go and uh, ride for for JV and for Canandel Draypack. Do we say uh, no? But because he really needed is is I agree with what uh, Jonathan said. Is um, is a very dedicated guy. He can, it is a tremendous rider who is not aware of his own limits. And, and the problem is, like many French riders, he was in his comfort zone in France, you know, uh, making good money without um, making many efforts. And I mean, he wants, to, you know, great stages in the Tour de France. But I really encourage French riders to go and, and you know, try something else, try, try a different approach, uh, be a little bit... Uh, uh, responsible over there, and I think probably an American team and the team with the philosophy that um, you know Slipstream has, has had forever is probably the best team for him. I I wouldn't be surprised if he did a great season. Um, maybe not this, but uh, if he stays with with Gunnar Gunnar which I hope he does, I'm sure he'll evolve as a human being, as a person, as a as a rider. I think. No, I, I'm, I'm not a great fan of his personally. Uh, he can be a real. How could I say without being rude? And I, it, it can be. <laughs> No, he, he's a guy, he's, he's, he's kind of, you know, the French tend to be uh, complacent from time to time, a little bit, not emotionally is not the word, but try, always complaining about something wrong, and it's not my fault, and blah, blah, blah. blah. And Pierre is, the, is, is like this a little bit, but as Jonathan said on the tour, well, he proved me wrong, you know, he was tough, he was, so 
Yeah, I, I really think, to, to go back on what uh, Jonathan said about Cannondale, I, I, I really th think they were unlucky this season because Rigo should have done better. I mean, and as Jonathan said, as I've seen him win the uh, in, in Canada uh, last year and he, he was close again this, this year in Quebec. So he's very good at these uh, uh, kind of state of races, probably better than in Grand Tours. Uh, Andrew Talensky, I've, I've always been a great fan of this guy, should, should, should you know, go a step forward Pierre Roland should also be a little bit better. The, the youngers, the young, young guys, uh, Formolo and, and, and Dombrovsky should. So I, I really see a bright future for Cannondale. I mean, it's a funny thing. We had so many little results that are like below the radar. But when you're looking at what is this team going to become in a year or two, you say, whoa, this is good. Like we were second place just by a couple of minutes on the team's classification in the Giro. Uh, we were second place in the team's classification in the Vuelta. And you say, well, that's not really important. And we weren't aiming for that. That was not the objective of the team. We weren't going after the team's classification, either one of those races. But what it shows is that there's a depth in the team. And that eventually, when these young riders start to, to really hit their groove, you know, things, things will happen. We just, we just lacked a little spark and a little bit of luck this year. But we were racing week in and week out. And they were trying to win week in and week out. We were never trying to, you know, game the point system so that we could be eighth or whatever. That's ridiculous. Betio, you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, that must be a big source of satisfaction. So I remember um, we talked to you a couple of years ago and you just inherited this group of riders from Cannondale and um, well, from what was the old Liquigas team. And looking at it from the outside, Betio almost looked, if you were being unkind, like the runt of the litter. And he was really, he was really, he was struggling to finish racing. He really was struggling to finish um, pro races. And it looked as though this was a guy who'd been a good amateur who was not going to cut cut it as a pro and then you know uh, i mean I, I sort of maintained that view of him and then but then speaking to people in the team over the last well last year they started to say well he's actually a really good domestique everyone really like has started to really really like him and then all of a sudden he starts producing results himself and that's a real kind of an unusual story of someone who just finds himself as a professional cyclist at a certain point but i mean that's been the story of our team from the beginning uh, you know, nobody ever thought Ryder Hegedal was going to win the Giro d'Italia. Nobody ever thought Christian Van Velde was going to finish top five in the Tour de France. Nobody ever thought, I and mean, we could go on and on and on with examples like this. I mean, people didn't think Dan Martin was all that great at first either. You know, our team has always been about finding the talent, you know, that, that other people have overlooked. I don't always love that. It's extremely gratifying when it happens, when it works. It's incredible. I mean, end of the day, as a fact, UCI confirmed fact, we're the smallest budget in the world tour. So we have to look for talent that other people have overlooked. We have to look for a guy like Taylor Finney who's looking for a second chance to come back in. That's what our budgetary options are. But when it actually works, when you actually get a Ryder Hedgedal, who I think when he won the Giro, his salary was maybe 300,000 euros. I don't remember exactly, but it was in that range. How many winners of a Grand Tour in the last decade have been on 300,000 euros? Ryder has it, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, this is what we're good at. And, but the thing of it is is that you're never going to consistently knock it out of the park with unproven riders. And, you know, so we don't. But once in a while when we do knock it out of the park, you know, people take notice and and it's and it's a million times more gratifying when you pull off the upset victory i mean it, it's really it's really fun and on that note just so you know and everyone else so last year i made some comments about you know pierre roland training like it was 1975 which he was which has nothing to do with french riders training like it was 19 roman bardet doesn't train like his 19 but pierre roland it was true with him it was true that, that wasn't a nationalistic statement that was a that was a pierre roland statement. but i started coaching pierre personally this october so I'm putting my name on the line to say, well, you know, if Pierre goes well this year, then uh, then that's that that I get to take kudos for that. If he goes like crap, then that's also my fault. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. Thank you very much to Rafa, our sponsors uh, since the Tour de France. Thank you very much to them. We're heading there later tonight, actually, for a live, a live well, it will be a live event because we'll be alive for it, I hope. And we'll be speaking with Jonathan and Francois about the future of cycling. So 
few people will be there and it'll be a Facebook Live event. Not that this is relevant because this podcast will be coming out after that. Yeah, but people will be able, to, be watch able to watch it on it. sort of catch yeah. up on the internet, won't Absolutely they? Absolutely, they will, yeah. Um, so we're here with Mr. Moneyball, Jonathan Vauters. Um, but Jonathan, you, you left us so you're looking confused. I was just talking, I was just thinking about your talking about, you know, getting great results from perhaps underrated riders. But you mentioned at the end there that you're you're coaching Pierre Roland. I know you've been coaching a few of the other riders as well. And that's quite a new thing for you. You were coaching Joe Dombrowski this last year. Yeah. How, how, how do you how do you manage that as the, the guy in charge of the team and, and with that sort of personal relationship with riders, coaching them as well? It's it's a tricky balance. Um, and I, I just tried it out this year with Dylan Van Barl and Joe Dombrowski. And Joe was on a contract year. Um, and so that was sort of, to me, that was where we were gonna, either going to find out that this was going to work okay or it wasn't going to work okay. Obviously, after the Giro that he did, um, he was in high demand. He certainly got higher offers um, from other teams, certain former employers. And he and I dealt with the renewal very professionally. Um, Andrew McQuaid is his agent. Um, it was tense and, and a little bit odd between Joe and I for a couple of weeks there when we were having to do that. And, you know, of course, I was thinking in my head, well, you know, Joe, you wouldn't have ridden as well in those stages of the Giro had I not been coaching you. And he's thinking in his head, well, I can go off and get any idiot as a coach and I would probably would have done better. And, you know, so you need to pay me more so on and so forth. Anyway, it came to a great conclusion. He, he renewed with us no animosity, so on and so forth. So there's a way to deal with it. It's, it's tricky. I, I will give it to you that it's tricky. I think he wrote a great Giro because he was keeping an audio diary for the cycling podcast. I think <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, that, that had more to do with it, I think. I thought you're, that's a no, secret you're right, there. I think right. you should get more of your writers to keep audio diaries for the cycling podcast. <laughs> um, what about next year then? Because you've got Seth Van Mark um, and Taylor Finney. I mean, both Seth Van Mark is a writer who you mentioned Tour of Flanders, Pyro Bay are, are his races. And Taylor Finney's always been talked about as a, a rider who could do well, um, Pyro Bay especially. Is that the thing that's really getting you going for next year? The, you, know, you, you mentioned when you signed Sepp Van Mark that um, you've won Pyro Bay before, of course, but winning that again with a rider like that would be, you know, would, would, would make, make any season success, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, lo I love the Cobble Classics. Even though as a rider, I never rode them. Um, I love them. I, I think they're the best thing that it's in cycling. I mean, I, I just, I think they're incredible. So I have a little bit of soft spot whenever there's a good classics rider that comes up to try to, to try to bring him over to our team. And, um, with Sep, it, it worked out. I mean, it was just timing and luck and there were a lot of factors in play and I'm still actually amazed that he chose to come to our team, but he did. And I'm very grateful for that. And I think that, uh, you know, with Sep and with Patrick Bevan and really importantly, Dylan Van Barl and Sebastian Langeveld, that we have a really, really good classics team. It'll be underestimated and nobody will talk about us in advance and so on and so forth, but I think when the bullet hits the bone, um, I think we've got four or five guys that can be, you know, in the in the pointy end of the race. What about Hugh Carthy, a British rider who you picked up? Um, we were kind of expecting a bit more from him at the Vuelta, but he looked, uh, he looked like he was struggling a bit, certainly mm -hmm. in the last week. looked like it was probably two weeks too long for him um but what do you make of him and, and um you know the adjustment from racing the level he's raced and and becoming part of your world tour group well i mean he's already proven that he's you know very competent at the world tour level i mean what he did in uh, volta catalunya was extraordinary as a 21 year old rider to me it was a little normal that he was subpar at the vuelta i mean again 21 years old he was great in catalunya he won Volta Asturias. He should have been second to Quintana in, in Ruta de Sud, but I forget what happened. Like somebody pulled him off his bike or whatever. Some, but it, you know, he had done the first six months of the season perfectly well. It didn't seem like in August when he was doing Burgos and that it what just wasn't coming together for him for the for the second part of the season, which it often doesn't when you're that young. I mean, it's hard to sustain you know that level of intensity for that long. But with Hugh, um, I mean, he's he is a determined young man. Um, He's, I think, you know, he is the prodigy of Charlie Wigelius. I mean, Charlie just loves this kid because he's hard-headed and he's all about getting the job done. And he's, you know, I, I, I don't mean to, to bemoan my own nationality a little bit, but a lot of the young American riders that we have come in are a little bit, um, they have high expectations 
of management and high expectations of hotel um, decorum and uh, food and lifestyle and, you know, living on the Riviera and racing bikes and everything will be wonderful and soon I'll be buying my first Maserati and so on and so forth. Uh, Hugh is not that at all. I mean, Hugh bootstrapped himself onto a Spanish continental team, moved himself to Pamplona on his own, doesn't actually want to move away from Pamplona, says, no, I, I quite like it in Pamplona. And we, we thought, well, for sure he's got a girlfriend there or something. No, th no girlfriend there, just likes Pamplona, likes living in an apartment by himself in Pamplona and riding six hours every day. This is your Charlie Wigelius style rider who just does it on their own two balls. Um, and I, th I mean, that attitude will take you a long way in professional cycling, more so than pure talent will. Well, uh, Charlie and uh, Hugh Carthy have the same coach, Ken Matheson, former Great Britain uh, road coach. It was Charlie's coach back in the day, now coaching Hugh Carthy. We talk a little bit about that in next week's episode of the Cycling Podcast, um, an experimental episode. It's called Lunch with the Cycling Podcast. I went for lunch with Charlie Wigelius and we had, uh, we had a nice meal and also talked about cycling for a bit. Um, and that will be out next week. Jonathan, you sort of insinuated there that some of your Amer young American riders might... Um, well, the, the, your, your team has been kind of renowned, maybe unfairly labelled as the sort of the home of the kind of preppy millennial, um, <laughs> prodigiously talented in the lab, um, you know, p would probably be studying, and maybe not an Ivy League college, but a middle-ranking college if they weren't riding for Cannondale. Um, and perhaps you've, ne you've needed... You've needed a bit of that grit and a bit of that kind of, um, you know, that sort of make it at all costs. I mean, in cycling, that's a dangerous, dangerous way to think about riders and think about careers. But um, maybe you, you've needed a bit more of that determination, particularly on the part of some of your younger riders. No, I agree with you 100 percent. I think that oftentimes, you know, the eccentricity of our team can can be its bright spot, but it can also be its downfall at certain points. And um, certainly having a few, you know, harder men uh, to lead by example doesn't hurt at all. I, I mean, that's the reason that Charlie Begelius is our head director, is that Charlie, I mean, of course, he's very smart, but he's, he's hard with these, as you would say... Um, would be going to a middle-ranked university in the United States, which is absolutely accurate. He's hard with these guys. And and they'll come to me and complain about it, and they'll say, well, Charlie's mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll say, no, Charlie is looking out for your career, and you need to listen to him. And... Um, you know, that's it's sometimes guys learn those lessons and sometimes they don't. Uh, but Netflix wouldn't download quickly enough <laughs> in the hotel. <laughs> yeah, is it for the same reason that you've decided to 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 all you know belgian and i mean you know classic uh, riders into the team because i mean seb van mark and sebastian langeville that that type of rider uh, it, they don't seem to be, to belong in the first you know at first sight to your culture and 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 in in the same kind of question how did you become so you know keen on 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 cobble classics i mean is it because you won it with uh, unexpectedly with van summeren or or, 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 they, or does it date back to uh, before that? It, it, it's from before that. I just always thought that those were incredible races. Um, but until I got to, I mean, the, the year that that I had to let uh, Matt White go, and I was sort of forced to put myself in the position as the director for the Cobble Classics, um, I learned a lot that year. I mean, thank goodness Andreas Clear was my road captain that year on the team because he basically taught me. I mean, he would just tell me, okay, you know, Jonathan, here's what you're going to say to us on the radio. <laughs> you know, okay, Andres, you just tell me what to do. Um, I mean, except when it came down to that moment where, you know, I, where Tor wanted to chase. And anyway, that was more complicated. But uh, I just loved those races from that moment forward. But going back to your point about Sepp and Sebastian Langeveld, well, what I would say is actually they fit in perfectly because Sebastian Langeveld is a guy who would be perfectly capable of going to university. He's a very intelligent guy. And Sepp van Marke is a high-maintenance pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I mean, on that note, we should probably... We could talk to you all night, Jonathan, yeah. and, and it's just as well we are. We're going to... We're going to be carrying on talking to you, so we better leave... We better leave something for that, um, some fuel in the tank. Um but thank you very much, Jonathan, for joining us this week on the podcast and for also um, talking to us for 2020 Vision, our French special, which is coming up 
as Lionel said, thecyclingpodcast.com for that. It'll be available in the next few days. But thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Francois. You're welcome. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. It takes some time, doesn't it? And finally, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.